Leeds United made the most of their second chance in the European Cup against Stuttgart. The team, they say, has more foreign reserves than the Bank of England. Leeds won 2-1 in Barcelona in front of a tiny crowd. Their hero was Karl Schutt. He scored the winner less than a minute after coming on as a substitute, and tomorrow's his birthday. And welcome back to another episode of Talking More Show. A rather impromptu one. Um, I arranged to get James on, uh, my guest James Scully. Welcome, James. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to look up some of those names in that intro there, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we um, I got I got James on to talk about a documentary he made um, about uh, Leeds' uh, trials and tribulations for what feels like forever. Uh, so we'll get into that with him in a bit. Uh, but if you're tuned in, remember to share the stream, pass it to other people, get them involved as well. So best place to start then, James, I think, is we've seen some pretty mammoth uh, documentaries appear around um, our beloved club in the last uh, two years, uh, particularly the one uh, at Amazon. So where did your documentary sort of idea and um, sort of start? Well, it started, so I had this idea that, I mean, like every every broadcaster, you know, I mean, Football Focus had one today, Amazon have got theirs, BT have done one, the Premier League have done their own. So it is a very crowded place at the minute. Um, so I had this idea in March, start of March, when it looked like we were we were just about to cross the line, of doing this film of the of the story of Leeds United told by, by the fans, the ones that have lived it, the ones that have been there throughout the last 20 years. I can't tell any further back than that because I'm only 27. But um, so it, just in my in my lifetime, basically. Um, and then COVID hit, and it kind of put it on hold for a bit. But what it did was it actually just developed the story even more. Um, so during lockdown, we planned it, we we arranged the interviews, and as soon as lockdown sort of was lifted a little bit, we went out and we just filmed it. And we wanted to get first-hand stories memories of you know things that stick in people's minds about the last 20 years so you've got people talking about Ridsdale's fish tanks um and th those are stories that don't necessarily come from you know if if, if a media body in london's made something you, know, you don't necessarily get those stories because because you need people that have lived it and it's, it's what amazon does really well too because it's made by leeds fans um so yeah we wanted to make something by leeds fans for leeds fans featuring yeah. leeds fans and and that's what we did i think yeah, the, I, I I love the little sort of individual stories. Like I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like, he obviously got given an iPad or something with Ridsdale on there, and he was like, "Oh yeah, he bought he bought a fish tank, didn't he? I remember that." <laughs> like, and uh, and uh, Rob, um, not Rob, um, God, his name eludes me at the moment, but saying basically Ridsdale just uses as like a giant credit card, uh, and then he oh, just Gary, goes, Gary Edwards, yeah. Gary Edwards, that's it. Yeah, sorry, uh, Gary, yeah. if you're watching this, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I just I liked them little. I think I think you hit the nail on the head with them little stories because I mean, there's been a lot of sporting documentaries about, aren't there? Uh, you know, with um, you know the Spurs one, the Manchester City one, yeah. and obviously now our own. And um, they they can be quite clinical, can't they? They can be quite um, heavily vetted. I think the uh, the yeah. Spurs one is a is a good example of that. Uh, that I, I feel like it's it's a good insight, but it's quite clinical. Um, whereas obviously with the oars, it's obviously over there on the Copper 90 YouTube channel. You've gone straight to the heart of the fans, you know, the people who've got them experiences, like you say. Um, how did you target them fans? Like, you know, did you have a, like a sort of broad brush of people you wanted to hit? Um, well, fil filmmaking in, in general, I mean, the, re the number one thing in filmmaking is access, which is what makes, you know, the Amazon documentary so good. And we didn't have that. Um, so we had to find access in a different way. And our access is getting inside people's heads um and unlocking all their their memories so we wanted to we wanted to get like a combination of fans so we had ben who i know from my time at the bbc um and i knew ben would be a good talker and ben went to every single leeds game last year and w worked with norman hunter and those guys in the sort of corporate area of ellen road and i thought he'd have a different perspective sort of on the club to say myself who sits in the stand um so I wanted to get Ben's view, plus, you know, he used to go back in the day. Um, 
20 years ago when we were talking. Uh, Matt, again, he, he, he goes regularly. Um, but he also, he also has this, this element of where he worked in the kitchens at Ellen Road for a, for a little while under Chilino. Um, and he told a good story. Unfortunately, we had to keep it out just cause it was, it was just, it was just a bit too long winded. Um, mm. but it tells a story of, of Chilino just coming into his kitchen and sparking up one day. Um, which is very Chilino, isn't it? Um, yeah. so Matt, Matt had that sort of different angle and then, and then I guess the, the one that sticks in most people's memories is probably, um, Kev with the the camper van outside Ellen Road. And I'm not going to lie to you. We were just filming some GVs down there and he pulled up. <laughs> what more could you wish for? He, he just he just fell out of the sky and landed in front of us. And so we, we went to speak to him and, and that's when he gave us the line about how he thinks the EFL created the coronavirus. And we just hit gold with that. But you make your own luck, don't you? Um, yeah. But I think Kev's represents the Leeds fan more than any other, any other person in that video. I think he's brilliant. Um, you know, I go home and away, and I could, I could, I could name you ten, ten different Kevs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah he's def- he definitely adds a character to it when he says that uh, the O'Leary side is the best side we've ever, ever seen. I thought that's going to, uh, that's going to draw yeah. some uh, controversy. I mean, it, maybe not until until this side that Bielsa has created, but certainly it was the best side I've ever seen in my yeah. lifetime at Ellen Road. Um, bit of recency bias, I think, there from from Kev because I'm sure some people that saw the Revy side might disagree. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I have to agree. Actually, we saying you know in our lifetime, I think so. Because like, I'm not much older than you. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably up there to be fair. But I think Bielsa might just be well on his way to trumping it, but in a different sort of level, if that makes sense. Obviously, yeah, they, they were fighting on, on Champions League fronts and challenging for the Premier League, whereas we've you know we've just sort of made that step back into the big time. So Bielsa's got a bit of a way to go with regards to that yet. But as a if you took the football inside of things. In its sort of, um, it, it, as it is, I think the football, in, the teams, uh, I think the else is arguably better than what O'Leary's was. Certainly more entertaining, I would say. Yeah, I definitely. mean, I, I, the, the O'Leary side was brilliant. They were a lot more solid, sort of, in terms of how they set out, whereas Bielsa's are just ferocious in attack, aren't they? And just an unbelievable thing to watch every single week. And it's what brought, it's what brought, it's what's brought everyone back to back to the club you know i think ben says it in the film it's it's what you it's what united it's what's united leads as a city as a club and as a fan base together i think that sums up sort of this bielsa side so just back to the back to the documentary then what like i've watched it twice uh maybe even three times now and i kind of like because i knew i was going to come on and interview you i was kind of thinking like when do you start like because I, I really like the initial footage of the sort of drone drone shot as well of uh, you know, around Leeds and around the ground. I love that type of thing. So, like, where do you start kind of piecing this together? Obviously, you're the expert. I'm not, but it, I'm just quite interested by that. Yeah. The... Well, the, I mean, so where we started, so we had these interviews, and there were probably some Some were two hours long, like Ben's was two hours long. Some were a bit shorter um, at an hour, but I'd, I'd say they were all over an hour. So we had, you know, seven plus hours of footage that we had to get into some sort of order and we wanted to do it um you know in a chronological order so tom tom leak who also produced this and edited this he basically chopped it all down so it made sense and then i went through his cut and then chopped that down even further until we ended up with six episodes of 30 minutes each which are you know each part of the the story and then that's when copper came on board and they wanted a, a 20 to 30 minute piece so then I took a machete to it and just chopped out everything almost um, and left some amazing stuff on the cutting room floor. But that's kind of what you need in order to make it flow. People probably wouldn't watch more than 30 minutes. It's just the way that the world is now. People's you know attention spans are very are very short um, and without access, it, it really needed to be 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so we chopped it all down that way. And then the intro, it was actually our third different intro that, that made the, the final show. We tried different ways of doing it. Um, we had we teed it up with Ridsdale originally, and then thought maybe we just need a you know a big comment at the start. So that's when we put um, Kev there talking about Leeds as you know a brand, and you know I think I think Roger Zanis referred to us as a brand before, and so has Angus Kinnear. So I think it was quite um, pertinent to the to the story to start with that. Plus you you like who's this character, um, and it just builds a bit of intrigue. So that's that's where we started. 
Um, and three months later, that, this is the final product. Yeah, I think the other striking thing is the name for the documentary. <laughs> where, where did that come? So um, if there's no kids listening, uh, f- fucked by Rids- Ridsdale, found by Bielsa. Where, where did that sort of idea come from? Well, that actually came from um, a Leeds fan inside the copper offices. Um, I don't know him personally, but we we toyed over the name for a while, and I think it was well worth doing that. Copper are obviously experts in what they do, you know. They're, their whole ethos is, you know, fans, um, and they know what works and what what doesn't work in terms of getting someone to click on a, a thumbnail on YouTube. So I, I pitched some names to them. Um, the Fall, The Rise, and Bielsa I pitched, I think it was. And then it kind of evolved from there. BT Sport released one, which was or Sky released one, which was called The Fall and Rise of Leeds United. So that soon went away. And then that then evolved and someone just came up with Fucked by Ridsdale, Found by Bielsa. And I think it's perfect, really. Yeah, there's, a, there's another sense of uh, perfection with this interview now because uh, I only realised watching the documentary again while my son were playing football that it's 20 years to the day since Lee Bowie scored that goal against AC Milan. Um, yep. I've, I tweeted it out from our our Twitter actually although I sat there I can't honestly believe it's 20 years and one of the questions you ask in, in the documentary towards the end is you know would you change anything and I think that, that's a good good place to so, sort of start with you uh, so in the last 20 years from Didda dropping and fumbling <laughs> on a rainy night at Ellen Road to <clears throat> skin Arabs crazy Italian chairman um Near enough insolvency, Ken Bates, many trialists, Edgar Chani, uh, <laughs> court cases, sacking managers during games, uh, playoff heartbreak. God, I'm, I'm really scratching around here. Would you change any of it then, James? Absolutely. Any of it? Not a thing. Honestly, I wouldn't. People will probably be like, yeah, you would. But I really wouldn't. I started going to away games in about 2008 when we were in League One, League Two, uh, not League Two, sorry, League One, and we were playing the likes of Hereford, who shouldn't even be, you know, above League Two. And I remember going to that game, and I remember coming back from that game. But I also remember a Leeds fan nicking a box of Kit Kats off the burger van outside, and <laughs> you don't, you don't get that at Old Trafford and at Anfield, and so those memories to me, you know, those those are where I basically started following Leeds home and away, and. I don't think I'd have had the same memories if you know if it had always been in seventy thousand seat stadiums with you know codes to get in and stuff like that. There's something quite special about going to Hereford and a paper ticket and a ball being paraded around the pitch in front of you. So so no, I wouldn't change anything. Um, and as Rob said in the fil- in the film, it's been fun on it. I mean, what more could you want? You've got a coke snort in Italian owner um, and a lot more. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's been yeah. fun. Yeah. The- for me, the uh, the minus fifteen season kind of it was quite fun, weren't it? It was quite enjoyable. Yeah. Like it, it, it kind of embo- embodied what Leeds is about. As in, we we like everybody hating us. We like everybody being against us. We like you know. There's a real siege mentality amongst the fan base. And as soon as we got doc, doc fifteen, you know, minus fifteen, and they were taught that we'd go insolvent, and we were seeing trialists coming in. I mean, I've spoke to Andy Hughes quite a few times. Obviously, we were around at that time, and. He was saying like trialists had come in, you'd see them two days and they'd disappear again, and and just things like that. And you know, I I remember the Hereford game uh, with the ball getting paraded around the pitch and stuff like that. And at the time, you were kind of thinking, just get us out of here as quick as possible, yeah. uh, because this is horrific. It was real crash bang wallop football. There were you know some real cloggers up and down that league, and we 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 toiled uh, we toiled down there. But looking back now, kind of we rose into glasses. It was quite an enjoyable experience. The 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 siege mentality of they're all against us. Let's prove them wrong. Um, well, great to a to an extent. Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to sit here now, isn't it? When we've got Bielsa and we're playing, you know, amazing football every week, and we've got a group of players that you know you can get behind to say that. But it was going to end at some point, wasn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. It it would have ended at some point. It probably ended a bit quicker than we all um, could have imagined. You know, even under he- Heckingbottom two years ago. Um, which is credit to Radrizani and Bielsa and the job they've done. But sitting here now, looking back, um, you can appreciate where we've come from. And and those memories, you know, the football, yeah, that's not a great memory, but the other memories around it, um, quite fun to look back on, I think. 
Yeah, one uh, just another one that's jumped into my head. Well, when we played this uh, first pre-season game and we had to put gaffer tape over the sponsor because we'd not got a new one yet. And then you look Brilliant. at us, you look at us now, adorned in Adidas. Um, yeah, you know, the, um, boasting the the biggest uh, commercial deal for a shirt sponsor for you know ever period. Uh, we we have come a hell of a hell of a long way. Uh, another bit I wanted to bring up in the documentary, and I thought uh, the Amazon one as well um, did a good job of it. Is the the tribute to Norman Hunter. Um, it it really hit the fan base hard, didn't it? The uh, the loss of Norman Hunter. I know it. Um, I know I I was particularly sort of upset by it, heartbroken by it, because, you know, such a, well, a legend as a player for a start, but such like fixtures and fittings around the place as well. You know, he was he was involved in everything. You saw him every match day. He, was, he would drag his chair along the gantry and, and plonk himself down roughly where everyone, which was normally around the halfway line. And, you know, um, but I would imagine a difficult subject to kind of cover in the documentary. Um yeah, what, what, was it difficult to try and do the you know the right thing if you like? You know the the whole coronavirus as a as a story. We we I thought about how best to tell this. Um, of course, when Norman died, we had no idea that how football would end and if it would come back. So there was still a, it was still up in the air as to how I'd tell this story. But then you know Norman died, and it was it was the funeral. I think when he was when he was going down. The tunnel at Ellen Road in in his you know in the casket and there was an empty Ellen Road and I wish I could have shown that in the film um, but I didn't own the rights to it um, and I think that was the moment then that I thought that the whole coronavirus story in the film needs to be told around Norman mm. and we had Kath, um who you know she watched the Revy's team in person um, and we had Ben who worked with Norman quite regularly at Ellen Road and. Between those two, I knew that they'd probably be able to recall, you know, some good memories of Norman. So I had that quote that I think he, I think he said it at the um, at the same time he, you know, he was on stage with Liam Cooper that the Amazon documentary shows, where he said, "I'd love to see him in the Premier League in my lifetime," and you know, sadly it didn't happen. Um, so I just got I got them both to read that quote out, um, and then that just elicited the emotion that you see. Um, and then, you know, everyone else sort of passed on the same message that, you know, we want to do it for Norman. And the players said that and the fans, you know, reciprocated that and we did it for Norman. And I hope that I hope that his family, if, if they see this or if they see the Amazon one, I hope they feel that that love's there from the Leeds fans to, to Norman and his family. Yeah, I'm I'm convinced they will, definitely will. Um, yeah, I mean, on the Norman one, I brought. I've I've told this story, and um, I did another podcast a bit ago as a guest, and they were saying like, oh, you know, all your experiences in podcasting and stuff. What's been your best? And I, I was lucky enough to watch the Brentford game last year on the gantry um, at Ellen Road when Eddie and Katie scored the the last minute uh, winner uh, from a cost to cross. And just as the game had started, if you can remember it, Brentford were very much in the game. It were a, it were a real nip and tuck game for quite some time. And I sat up on the gantry and um, obviously watching the game. And I, I just sensed somebody pulling a chair up uh, alongside me, but I never really paid much attention because I was focusing on the pitch. And then I, I got what were like, not a punch, but it was a very um, robust tap on the arm. And uh, Norman Hunter sat aside of me, uh, just ripping the living daylights out of uh, Pablo Hernandez for misplay <laughs> misplacing a pass. And he just spoke to me like he'd known me for 20 years and just wanted my opinion on Pablo playing in that particular role because I don't think Pablo started that game particularly well from what I remember. And... Uh, I remember like when he, he got up just for half time to go down to the suite to do his um, sort of half time stuff. I remember thinking, Norman Hunter's just come and tap me on the arm and ask my opinion on 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 you know on on Pablo Hernandez. Like, you know, this is stuff that you can't write. It'd be like stuff I'll probably tell my grandkids about and my son yeah. and people like that. And then obviously, um all the stuff around obviously him losing his life during COVID and then see you know, this the um the other quotes that have come out about him saying, you know, it's, it's it's been a good life, hasn't it? I, you know, I got I got yeah. to play for Leeds United, stuff like that. And you just think the thing, yeah. I mean, the thing with Norman, you you mentioned him there. Ben said the same thing. Like he he talked to anyone on a match day. He didn't care who you were. He didn't care who he was. You know, he'd talk to anyone and he'd talk to anyone about anything. Um, but for me, you know, as someone that didn't you know get anywhere near to seeing that era play, Norman was always the voice of Leeds United and I wanted to get that in the film as well and I think 
I think Lee, one of the interviewees, says says that you know you'd hear him on the on the commentary. And when we were in the Champions League, it was Norman Hunter's voice that sort of accompanied the images. We used to listen to it with, well, my dad had a dodgy satellite back then, so we used to get like Russian <laughs> Russian Russian versions of, uh, <laughs> of of Lee's game. So we'd mute it, and then we'd put Norman and and um, Ian Dennis and you know even Bryn for a time there on on the radio and. So he he touched he, he he touched different eras of the Leeds United fan base, and that's quite uncommon for such a you know a player that played in the seventies. It's really uncommon. So um, yeah, just a terrible terribly sad time, and I wanted to get that across in the film. Yeah, and I thought I thought you did absolutely excellent of getting that across in the film because I know when Norman died, we talked about how we were gonna sort of talk about it on the podcast, and I know we're just a, we're just a podcast, you know. And it's just about our opinions and kind of thing. But it were a difficult one for us to get across because we really wanted to get across what he meant to us. But none of us could really find the words or the way in which we wanted to say it. And I thought the documentary did a great job of of doing that. And, you know, it was sadly missed. And it's a real shame that he didn't get to see us come out at, at Anfield for that first game back in Premier League because, you know, it would have meant the world to him. But uh, we're there now and, um, and we did it for him. Um so where can people find the documentary if they've lived in a cave and not uh, found it already? <laughs> so it's it's on Copper 90, which is, uh, you know, a very popular sort of YouTube channel, Instagram account um, that focuses on fans and football and culture and everything that surrounds it without actually showing any football, which is quite an incredible, um, you know, an incredible thing to do. So it's on Copper 90's uh, Showcase YouTube channel, which if you just search Copper 90, it should come up um on youtube you can also find clips on their instagram account again copper 19 there's a bit on on twitter as well um but yeah youtube youtube is the one for the full film um just search copper 90 we are leads and it'll come up happy days um i can't let you go james without talking about this season what's been your thoughts so far obviously we've only played one one game but there's lots of stuff to talk about in terms of transfers and stuff like that yeah i mean i don't get i don't get too involved with transfers if i'm honest because you can drive yourself insane just listening to all the rumour mill. Um, so I don't, I don't really care about players until they're through the door and, and on the pitch, to be honest. So, um, like the the, the Paul stuff, you know what? I don't know who he is. You know, I won't know him if I passed him in co-op. So um, until until he's on the pitch, I don't really care about him. Um, but what I will say is, I thought I thought Cock looked good last week. I thought he looked comfortable on the ball. He looked like a Bielsa player. Um, you know, Struick was thrown in at the deep end. It don't get much tougher than that. Um, hopefully, we'll be a bit stronger with Cooper in there today. Um, but I was impressed last week, and I think we're going to shock some people. I think we already have shocked some people. So, um, if we keep up the same intensity and the same sort of um, you know willingness to run that we've that we've known from this Bielsa team for the last two years, hopefully, we'll do all right. And the fact that we're out of the cup now, you know, it's not a massive deal. It's just one less game for us not to be sad that we're not at. Um, and hopefully it keeps their their energy high, you know, throughout the the forty four games or whatever the maximum that we have to play. Even that includes if we get to the FA Cup final, which you know it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, transfers is an a, an ongoing saga all the time. Um, I think obviously running a podcast on a Wednesday, we have to talk about it, which kind of, make, kind, kind of makes you invested in it a little bit, which can be a bit of a nightmare. But yeah, I think the thing is. Victor Orta and Andre Rajazani and Angus Kinnear and the senior management have bought themselves enough wiggle room to do the deals that they see fit. And so far, with the yardstick of Rodrigo and Cork, although we've hardly seen a massive amount of either of them, it, the, for me, they bought themselves some time t- to bring in whoever they want, really, whether it's Rodrigo de Paul or whether it's, you know, somebody else. Um, you know, they, they'll do what's best for the team. And with Bielsa in charge and them guys, I, I, I do generally think that they've got the... Um, They've got the the best interests of the team and the best interests of Bielsa and the best interests of the fans at heart. So I think we, we don't we don't need to be too downhearted if it's not Rodrigo de Paul. Although a lot of people are very much invested in Rodrigo de Paul being the the signing, but yeah, we'll have to we'll have to just wait and see on that one. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, then James um, Fulham today. Um, how do you see that going? BT Sports at three o'clock. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a tough one because obviously we've played Fulham twice and. Twice they've actually given us a good game, and I know the scoreline probably doesn't reflect that from you know from the running. But that first half, they were all over us, and they were by far the better team in that first half. Um, and we just nicked a goal, and then we just pulled away from him in the second half when Pablo came on, I think, wasn't it? 
well, that might be a different game. I don't know. Pablo came on a lot in the second half in, in that running. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So I'm expecting a tough game today, and I think I think it'll probably be a you know a, a one nil or a two one type game. Um, Cooper should be back, so that's good. Um. So yeah, I'm expecting a close game, but you know, hopefully, uh, we're on the right side of it, and it'd be nice to to get Rodrigo off to a scoring start at home, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think he's going to need still a little bit longer to adapt. I felt a little bit sorry for him getting put into that uh, whole game on <laughs> on Wednesday because Leeds had such yeah. the fans had such high hopes to see him finally in the lead shirt, which we got to do. But he, he fed off scraps pretty much all the game. He never really got an opportunity. Took his penalty well, uh, which is always a good thing to see. But um, you can yeah, see it's, his it's, class, though. I think when he's dropping deep for that ball and he's turning, and you can see that he's you know he's he's just a, a next level up, isn't he? Um, yeah, they just need to put the ball in the back of the net, which is what every striker needs to do at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think it'll be a tight game today. Uh, Scotty Parker does seem to be able to to get a tune out of his side against us and make it difficult for us. But um, and and I think there's probably a little bit too much on uh, sort of emphasis on the fact that they got beat three 0 by Arsenal and we ran Liverpool close. I think um, you know today might be a bit more of a tough affair than Liverpool because I don't think Fulham will come and come at us like Liverpool did, which kind of plays yeah. into our hands a little bit. So I think we might see a little bit more of a championship type game today where they'll try and pack people behind ball when they can and uh, probably get us on counter. I would imagine they'll try and do that um, today yeah. and they'll probably let us have possession for a large period as well. So um, thoughts for the season then? What, what kind of aim do you think that we need to have? Um, I'm very much in the camp that stay in the Premier League and anything else after that's a bonus. Um, what about yourself? Yeah, stay in the Premier League for me, consolidate, have a have a comfortable season. I mean, if you had a season like Sheffield United had last year, I'd say that was above expectations. If you can just consolidate in anywhere between 10th to you know 16th and never really have that worry of relegation, um, that'd be nice. You know, we've had a lot of excitement these last few years, so... You know, whilst you're not at the games, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world just to have a, a boring season where you finish mid table, would it? Um no. and then hopefully we can we can build on that, you know, bring in more players, get more money, increase our sponsorship even further, um, and just build, you know, build the build the club back to where it, it belongs and where it should be and where we all want to see it. Yeah, absolutely. And um it's been a already in the short time we've been in the Premier League, because obviously there was a short break between the championship and the Premier League starting. You can already see the amount of eyes on on Leeds United from all over the world. Um, we've certainly seen it in the podcast. Um, some comments we like we regularly get a, a glut of Argentinians watching, and I've no idea they have any idea what we're saying because we all got really <laughs> really strong Yorkshire accents. But um, yeah, and we've had people from Chile and all over the place, and it's all Bielsa really that brings it. But it's also the the juggernaut that is Leeds United being back in the Premier League. The you know and, and like I went down to Ellen Road yesterday just for a bit of a mooch around, which I do quite often. I don't know why. It just it's like my happy place. Not really ever changes, but I just go for a walk around anyway. Um and I went down yesterday a bit of a mooch around club shop and a bit of a walk around and it's just a buzz around the place. I mean, I remember doing a doing a similar thing before we were in the Premier League, before Bielsa came in, and it, like a ghost town, you know, it, you wouldn't have been surprised to see a tumbleweed yeah. bouncing across the front, but now there's people having photos with clicks you know, artwork, there's there's people in and out of the shops, people looking on the Bremner Square for stones and having photos and stuff like that. And it's just we do we do feel like we're very much on 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 the up and, and back to where we belong as you know what me and you remember as kids when we were at an established Premier League side and it weren't even thought about that we'd ever get relegated. Even when I first started watching in like ninety four, ninety five and we had, you know, Carlton Palmer and people like that, it still never crossed your mind that Leeds would ever get relegated out of the Premier League. Um and yeah, it's just I, nice to I be think- out there. I think that's a credit to to Rajrizani and Angus Kinnear and the work they've done. I mean, they wanted Ellen Road to be a place that people come 365 days a year and not just, you know, 18 times or 19 times a season. Um, so they, they've made it into a place where, where people feel those sorts of, um, th- those emotions and people do feel it's their happy place. And that square, I mean, my family's got a square on, on Bremner Square right next to it, right next to the statue. Um and it is, you know, when we when we got promoted and we went to the celebrations, that was the first place I went, um, was to that square. So it, it, it has become sort of like a, a place to be. Um, and aren't you glad there's no hotel there? Yeah, it's much better. A hotel and casino, <laughs> I think, at one point. Yeah. It? Hotel and casino, yeah. It's, um, it's much better. And yeah, cre- credit to them guys as well, because, you know, they've done 
to turn it around, I mean, I was, I was chatting to uh, George Smith, um, Halifax uh, located MMA fighter, but he's a season ticket holder, uh, season ticket holder in the cop, and uh, we were just chatting yesterday. And even in such a short period of time, you know, two years ago we signed a broken Izzy Brown, and now we're signing Spence number nine. Um, <laughs> But even yeah. even like little things going down to Ellen Road, like I take my lad down and we've got a Bremner a Bremner stone, and uh, you walk down and he's like, oh, which, which section are we? And I'm like, oh, we're in Bobby Collins, and he's like, all right, oh, we're Bobby Collins, and you're like you're kind of giving them the history as well by proxy because he's like, who's Bobby Collins? Well, to be honest, Judd, before my time, Bobby Collins, but Eddie Gray and all the Revy team I always cite Bobby Collins as one of the biggest influences in in changing the fortunes, at, um, you know, under Leeds. So. Yeah, it's just it's just a nice club to be around again, isn't it? We're not having to worry yeah. about debentures and uh, and tax not being paid on yachts and and um, you know selling Fabian Delft to pay for some executive boxes and and stuff like that. It's just we're a football yeah, club, again, nice. aren't we? It's nice to just worry about football, isn't it? You know, it's nice to get to three pm on a Saturday and you know you're not worrying whether your manager got fired last night, um, you know, by by a new owner. Um, you know, you're not worried about. You know, is Jimmy Kebby or, or Stewart going to be a decent player? Or you're not worried about any of that. You just you know that a you're going to get a product on the field. You've got a decent team off the field that are, are making the club work. Um, and it's just nice, it's just a nice place to be. And you know, we've got Adidas on our sleeves. Well, I don't. I've got Asics or whatever this is, but uh, you've got Adidas on your sleeves, and it's just nice. And, yeah, and we're is. back. And hopefully, you know, in a few years' time, we'll be even further along the road. Yeah, so if you're listening uh, and watching live or listening along on the podcast version after, go check out the Copper 90, uh, James's documentary. It's fantastic and it's great to go back and have a little bit of a, a look back because even stuff I'd forgot, uh, to be honest, like like the fish tank and like Seth Johnson, I'd, I'd erased them from my memory, but um, I remember them again now. Uh, and the ball around the Hereford, yeah. There's even there's even more that we didn't put in there. Um, there's some brilliant stories and I might start releasing them, you know, on Twitter or something because... There's some brilliant ones in there, and I'm just going to leave you with one. So Gary Edwards, who uh, who we interview in the film, not missed a game for however many years until this year. Um, and he he was interviewing Chilino in his office um, for a book that he was writing. And Chilino st- stood up halfway through and just walked to the window. And he just stares out the window and he goes, he hates me. He hates me, he does. And Gary's like, what's what's he on about? What's he on about? It points up, looks at me every day and goes, he hates me. So Gary walks over to Winder, looks out at Winder. He's pointing at Don Revy statue. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, that, well, that kind of sums up where, we, where we've where we been, um, I think. Yeah, uh, another Chilino story before we go, because it's a good one. Um, I know somebody who worked under him at Leeds, who was uh, chief executive for a time. And I said to him on a, a podcast I did many years ago, saying, what would it like to work for him? And he went... It's like walking a tiger and hoping it doesn't eat anybody and trying to stop it. But then occasionally it'll slip the lead and maul somebody and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And I'm like, it's a good analogy. Perfect. <laughs> to be fair, okay. yeah, perfect analogy. So. Uh, anyway, James, thanks very much for your time on this Saturday afternoon. You. I know you'll be some uh, pre-match prep, no doubt. Um, I'm going to do some in a bit. Uh, it'll involve probably buying some beer from shop and, and, and yeah, listening. Yeah, a but... sandwich, I think listening to some content before it starts. Uh, Big thanks to everybody who's tuned in when we've done it live. Uh, A few bits coming in on the uh, comments, but I'll save them for uh, another day. Um, James, again, thanks for your time. Go check out uh, the documentary on Copper 90, uh, Fucked by Ridsdale, found by uh, Bielsa. It's absolutely cracking. Uh, Go check it out. Uh, Big thanks to everybody. And uh, that's it. I'll see you. Cheers, James. Cheers. Thank you.